Here we go. All right. Welcome to this week's Tipples Wine of the Week virtual wine tasting. This is Elizabeth and Jeff Faudre, the owners of Tipples Brews and Wines in Gainesville, Florida. Glad you guys are here. Pretty sure you're going to be glad you're here too. This is a delicious wine. So uh, um, let's get into it. This week we are drinking the Luca Laborde Double Select Syrah from Mendoza, the Uco Valley within Mendoza, Argentina. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have not already done so, go ahead and pop that bottle open. Um, I would say uh, this is a nice red wine. I'd like to bring mine down to cellar temperature, not a requirement, mm -hmm. but I throw mine in the fridge for about 30 minutes before I open it. I was very proud of myself that I remembered to do that last week. Oh, yeah, that's great. When you're on your own? I guess. See, when I have to, I do take care of the whole alcohol thing. I just normally rely on you to do it for me, yeah. so I don't have to. I guess that's fair enough. You've got somebody to handle that yeah, for you. Yeah, there you go. I have people for that. It's a, <laughs> right? it's a big wine. Give it a good swirl in your glass. Let it take a breath. This will evolve as we're tasting. Uh, if you've just popped it open, um, ours has not been open that long. Uh, it will it'll evolve, but it starts out delicious. And it becomes even more delicious. So I will say, um, it's it's a uh, it's a trip worth taking. Yeah, ours has only been open what like ten minutes. Probably about Something that. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, really love the temperature we got too, though. So I'm happy with that. The color's gorgeous. If you will, let's go to the first slide. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here we are. Ratings on this guy are no slouch. James Suckling, ninety four. Robert Parker, ninety points. Uh, season on season, vintage on vintage, uh, more appropriately, 90 plus points on this, this beautiful wine. Um, robust uh, food pairings, spiced lamb chops, spare ribs, braised beef, or sharp cheeses and blue cheeses. All right. So. so that's kind of actually, though, a, a big gap between the 94 and the 90. Like for what we sure, see good point. normally, hmm. I think t like one or two points is the norm right. for it. Um, that's a fair point yeah yeah, yeah. because and I feel like I feel like with wines 94 is kind of like much better than 90 is no you, yeah and you are right and, and mm -hmm. there, there's that whole thing where it, yes there's a subjectivity to it but you're right the cluster tends to be a little tighter most mm -hmm. of the time if you see a 90 you'll see a 91 and a 92 mm -hmm. don't normally see that 90 to 94 point jump so it'll be interesting to see what we as a group think about you know who was a little closer to the mark mm -hmm. on this guy you know so um some of you may notice that we are not drinking the tanat that <laughs> i tried to bring in the last two weeks that is just not going to happen um evidently their inventory was wrong so the grecian tanat is not going to be a thing but we do have two bottles left in the store ever in the near future like, not in the near yeah. future at all okay. it's um i have to wait till the next import so so Again, like supply chain issues and stuff. I, I think they just ran out. It's a, it's a small producer. Oh, okay. Anyway, okay. I think they just simply, I don't know how, but they had, um, their inventory was off. It's going to happen. Mm. So. Okay. So. To, to not, not going to happen. happen. Nice. It was to not to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. you guys know how to make Jeff smile. I love it. <laughs> Well, I love the dad jokes coming from women. I, I, I think that's great. Yeah, there you go. Well, that that was Chris and Robin, though. It could have been either one of them. Okay. Right? Well, yeah. fair enough. Okay. I'm putting my faith in. And I don't. We don't have the can. Like we didn't see. Like if you were pointing to one of you, we right. didn't see which one it was. So. Okay. Um, ready? Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, so before we go into the label, let's jump back out. Stop sharing. Okay. We'll talk about our take our initial impressions on the wine, right? All right, varietal content on this guy is all Syrah. So this is all 100% Syrah, 13.5% alcohol. Mm, rich, dark fruits on the nose. I'm just thinking, I don't know that I've ever had a Syrah I don't like. <laughs> you know, like Syrah is one of my go-tos. I never met a Syrah I didn't like. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Syrah is a great, mm -hmm. great varietal. Um, uh, age worthiness, right? Uh, we always go into that. So is this an age-worthy wine? You have your presentation ready? Yeah, mine. Yeah, okay. All right. So it's 13 and a half. 13 and a half percent. So it's on the red. Tannins. On the red, it's right at the low normal, right? right? Normal, mm -hmm. but low normal. Mm -hmm. Um, tannins. 
Mm -hmm. You said it would evolve. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say 10. It's my guess. 10 is normally like the low end that we go with. Okay. Right. <laughs> I would say lower than 10 on this one. Okay. Not that that makes it a worse one. Okay. It's just simply, this is a, it's a very ripe wine. It's ready to drink. Okay. I wouldn't go beyond seven. Mm. And optimally, I think five. It's a 2019. So, okay. so we're talking about drink it by 2024, 2025. Okay. Uh, I think that's going to be more of what they were going for. Okay. It's not going to go bad mm -hmm. after that, but I think you're going to go over the peak of what they were really aiming sure. to create. Oh, and if anybody had wine left from the last bottle, which we normally don't because we're together, right. but I guess you were drinking different things. And so you finished it last night. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yes. because he had other bottles. So he finished right. the last one. He's like, this is still good. Was, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say, look, not a wine snob. You know, the people like, oh, two days, three days max. You know, <laughs> it was from Tuesday to Sunday. Right. But I'd kept it bottled up, mm -hmm. you know, and chilled. And it was still good. That Marcelon can hang. We end up with partial bottles a lot. So like sometimes we'll have ones that do that, mm -hmm. that you're just like, oh, no. You know, oh, right. Yeah, right? I have definitely. I'm right. like, nope, pouring that one but, down the drain. But yeah, it was. Which is what I anticipated. Right. But right. I thought, well, it's in the fridge. Let me taste it no, before it I so get good. rid of it. It was good. Mm -hmm. It was good. So, so okay. another another point for Marcelon. There you go. So, and all then, right. um, oh, and the hogs that's worked on it all week. Oh, nice. And then, okay, so then we have some comments about this wine. Bold okay. flavor, like the tannin amount, strong Syrah, but not a back of the throat alcohol punch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then incredible how inky it is. Crazy dark. Right. Oh, yeah. Beautiful inky, mm -hmm. um, beautiful dark color, dark mm -hmm. um, fruit, right? So we're getting plum and black cherry, black plum, blackberry. Um, um, I'm getting a bit of like a black tea and a dark chocolate. On this guy, definitely get the dark chocolate. Um, definitely like a, almost a, and we have a we have a chocolate with with smoked sea salt on it at the store, mm -hmm. and that I'm not getting a ton of smoke on the nose, but just a little mm -hmm. bit of like a a smoky chocolate. Yeah, mm -hmm. which I think is delightful. That's delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a bit of a hickory quality to me on the nose. I can mm. get that on the nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, no, actually, the more I think about it now that I'm really keyed in on it, a bit of a smoky quality, which is very standard for Syrah on the palate as well. That's very nice. Okay, I'm not getting we, that. That's we, right. we, uh, we were just saying, like, because we definitely got the smoky quality of it. Uh, it mm -hmm. almost reminds me of like barbecue sauce you get this like mm -hmm. a little bit of that hickory a little bit of that smoky it's a little sweet um uh she mentioned molasses um, yes I yeah i like it mm -hmm. a, little, a brown sugary type of thing but very very dark mm -hmm. right like a like a caramelized brown sugar yeah. Like one of the sweeter barbecue sauce kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Which is my favorite kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a sweet and smoky thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with a beautiful dark fruit. Um, you know, on the herbal side, maybe a bit of a tobacco quality on there. And there's a lot going on. So it'll unpack slowly as we talk through it, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, nice. I love the, yeah. And actually, honestly, the more I'm sitting here, I'm talking, I'm giving myself a moment between sips. And I am getting a bit of like a tobacco finish hanging out on the back of my palate. I feel like now that ours is opening a little bit more mm -hmm. that I'm getting on the finish, just a little bit of pepperiness on the finish. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh my God. That is exactly right. <laughs> oh, okay. That is exactly right. <laughs> the we're note of surprise. We're literally about to do that. No, not a note of surprise, <laughs> but I'm like, you nailed it. Like you're, you're getting so good at this. I love it. So I'm um, not leading any of these, just so you know, if, if Jeff can't be here, it's not happening. We're just going to drink and be like, look, it's red. But like, I tell you, like a black tea, but if you go with like a dark, like a, a peppery, mm -hmm. dark chocolate coffee combo, any of those things are all legitimate observations. And it will depend on what you're eating it with, if anything, and what you're interpreting it as. But 
all of those are completely on the table for this guy. So um, let's jump back to the slides. We'll cover the label and what I would be thinking if I was cruising a wine shop and didn't already know this wine as I look at it. Um, just uh, a few thoughts. So, all right, so here we are. We look at Luca. All right, obviously, that's the winemaker. Laborde, double select. That means nothing to me. All right, Laborde. I'm, I'm assuming Laborde, I would go, mm, that's probably the name of the vineyard. Okay. All right, double select means nothing. That is not a normal wine term. I'm assuming it's an it's like extra special of selection of reserva grapes. Right. terms. That exactly. It has no definition. It has no exact definition. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it means something to them. And because I know and respect the winemaker, I know it's not just thrown on for marketing purposes. Okay. Right. So Syrah, I love that the, <coughs> you know, the, the varietal is right there. I'm going to drink a Syrah tonight. Great. And, you know, and it's one of those that you build up as you drink different varietals. You say, okay, tonight, barbecue spare ribs, that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. I want to be all about Syrah. Uh, vintage right there, 2019. Argentinian, Uco Valley, Mendoza. So that takes a little further, right? So Argentina, boom, that's obvious. All right, everyone can picture Argentina. Mendoza, not all wine, but most wine from Argentina is from Mendoza. And then Uco Valley. So that is the lesser known version, right? That's a subsection of Mendoza. So it would mean something for me. It will mean something for all of you by the time I get done with the presentation tonight. So, but when we, when we see on a label, like when they're getting more and more specific with where something is, right. haven't we said that that's like normally a really good thing? That is a good thing, <laughs> okay. right. So you get here, you Argentina, Mendoza, Uco Valley, you're going three levels down. And then you have this name Laborde, which mm -hmm. almost seems, which it is in the case, goes to a specific vineyard. Okay. That is all good things. The more specific that they're throwing, they do that for a reason. And it's because they want credit for their work. Sure. Right? We'll take a look at the back. All right. Um, I'm celebrating the board's old wine double uh, Masal Syrah selection. So I'm reading, you know, the little making history doesn't tell me a whole lot more. Yeah. It's pretty much what was on the on the label. <clears throat> Laura Catena, that means something to me. All right. Catena wines from Mendoza are some of the best in Argentina period. So we've had a Catena tasting right. before. So like the um, the people that have been to that or, or heard us talk about it might see that and say, oh, Catena, I recognize that. Right. One. Yeah. And this is, which we'll, we'll learn about later. So it's not part of the Catena family vineyards. Oh. This is a Laura Catena special project on the side, right? Which we'll talk a, a little bit more about. So the word Catena does and like, oh, Catena, wait a minute. Right. Those are amazing wines. Right. Um, so that's what it would say to me. We look on a, um, alcohol, 13.5% by volume. Okay. Um, it's a red wine. Other than that, you're like, okay. Is this the distributor of the Vine Connections? Vine Connections is the importer. Okay. And Vine Connections does do a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. They don't have as big of a reputation as some of the very, it's a kind of a rarefied air for an importer to have so much, like Kermit Lynch is mm -hmm. a great example, right? Kermit Lynch is actually known in the wine world separately from the wines that he imports oh, wow. because he's selects such amazing wines right okay. so but that's pretty rarefied air most people don't know but fine connections does choose some some beautiful imports no doubt so i'd say overall what i would take away from this is that almost everything i needed to know was on the front which i love they put mm -hmm. it right out there and that we should be talking about a pretty great wine when the fact that they're drilling down all the way to the vineyard itself sure and that we can say, oh, easily, this is a Syrah. Easy to figure out, right? Yeah, it says so. There it is. All <laughs> right. So there's labels. Let's go. So the Syrah grape. We've already talked about a bit of what we were experiencing. Syrah, also known as Shiraz. Um, origin is in southwest France. So... Syrah is most famously from the Rhone and Northern Rhone regions, Southern Rhone, Northern Rhone regions in France. Well, that's in the Southwest. So it, the origin is in Southwestern France, which we'll look at a map in a moment. And it's a crossbreed between two obscure grapes that really have made no impact on their own in the world wine drinking, okay. right? Do they get blended with things? No, not really. No, They're just, they just know, made a good baby. They, they did. You, you know, they, they <laughs> obviously at some point 
were being grown and I guess still are somewhere, okay. but it's the Dereza and the Mondeus Blanche grapes made Syrah. So was that a white grape, the second yep. one then? Interesting. Which, by the way, don't forget, Cabernet Sauvignon right. comes from a red and a white mm -hmm. grape as well. So yes, you can get an yeah. intense red grape with a white grape being one of the parentage, you know, one mm -hmm. of the parentage grapes. So, so this is a, uh, a thick-skinned, medium tannin, medium acidity, which the, the acidity, the lower acidity mm -hmm. is one of the things that keeps it from going 10 plus years okay. on there. But it also is one of the things that makes it luscious and wonderful to drink right away. Okay. So there's a give and take on yeah. that, right? And look, how many people are really thinking, I bought this bottle. I really, really don't want to open it for 13 years. Like, no, you know, that's very rare. Right. Yeah. You might do that every so often with a bottle, but you're not going to want to just right. every bottle you buy. Oh, okay. Well, I need to wait for this one. I need right. to wait for this one. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, that thicker skin and the balance with the, you know, medium acidity in there gives you intense flavor and color, uh, which I think we can all agree. The, mm -hmm. the great, great intensity. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here it is. So it is from southwestern France here, as it goes into the mountains. Okay. Is the origin is over here, and now it's used widely throughout southern Rhone, northern Rhone, and then even in the Languedoc, in that kind of area. So a lot of it there. That is the origin. A lot of growth in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's called Shiraz. Um, and, and a lot in the United States as well. So, and obviously beautifully down in South America, Argentina yeah. and Chile. Oh, it looks like we have a chat. Yep, we do. Oh, you're getting better at that. Thanks. That is Southeast France. See, that's what I kept thinking too. I was like, did I reverse the... I reversed them. Yeah. Yes, yes. So there we go. How about Southeast France? Because I kept, I kept picturing it this way and then you went that right. way and I was like, Okay. No, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. So that's that's where it was. So okay. excuse me, everybody. I apologize. I don't know why I wrote Southwestern down in there. So anyway. fair enough. Yep. Because see, the sun rises mm. in the east. Yes. So that's not yeah. And no, I I get that. Okay. <laughs> hey, I could be wrong once in a while. All right. So you know what? I'm just going to say from now on, it's from Southern France. There you go. I was just laughing at that. I can be wrong once in a while. Comment. <laughs> Fair enough on that too. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to do to reverse them. Right. Yeah. So, okay. See, that's what you, you were very smart with the top though. You just said from Southern France. Southern, you know, honestly, that's where I intended to go. You could even go Because broader. there Trans are... <laughs> There were some discussions about it being um, the or that it was originally used in Bordeaux a little bit, mm -hmm. but that's not as much. Like I've talked, to, I've read much more extensive things about it coming from the mountains okay. over on the east. So maybe there's and some then, debate about where where it's from. Yeah, let's go with the there's debate and Jeff didn't just mess up. How about that? Okay, so now are we going to go to Argentina on the next one? No, no, no it's okay. not time. We're going to talk more about the grape. Okay. Would you like for me? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So here we are. Primary flavors, blueberry, black plum, milk chocolate, tobacco, green peppercorn. So. See, I wouldn't have said milk chocolate though. Okay. I happen to agree. Okay. So I prefer, I, I'd say chocolate in general. It can be milk chocolate, but it can also be a nice dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. I would say tonight, not as dark as baker's chocolate. Oh, there's not a bitterness mm -hmm. to it right mm -hmm. but the dark chocolate mm -hmm. tobacco on the finish green peppercorn you said black i happen to think black works in this one so let's just okay. say let's go peppery peppery yes i never think of green peppercorn i just think of like black and white pepper so well no and the thing is i've had a lot of french syrah as well mm -hmm. and most of them i would just say peppery in general okay. like there's a lot of black pepper in there i would not I would not put it into just the box of green peppercorn. Okay. I've, I've had the whole spectrum in there. Okay. So. so this is on the low end as far as the ABV for Syrahs in general, not just mm -hmm. for the um, the reds. Right. Okay. So had a little less sugar going in or mm -hmm. 
they specifically chose to finish fermentation and leave extra fruitiness in the wine. Okay. One of the two, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't know for sure it wasn't there. So um, is it a dry wine? Yes. Dry is one of the things I like to say. Dry is one of those things that is one of the only parts of wine assessment that is empirical. Oh, Dryness sure. is a measure of how much residual sugar there is, period, mm -hmm. right? There are perceptual differences, which is, so it's like, oh, and there's the wine tasting thing because it's always like, yes, but, right, in wine. So, um, but the bottom line is you can have something like this where some people would say, oh, I like the sweetness of this wine because it is fruit forward, right? Right. But it isn't sweet. It's fruity, mm -hmm. but dry. Okay. Uh, I actually had that discussion again today, which is a common thing. And I get it. It's a hard thing when we're eating. If you're eating a strawberry or a blackberry and it's nice and ripe, you're like, oh, that's a sweet fruit. Mm -hmm. But there is a difference between fruitiness and sweetness. An actual sweet version would be very different. It's so. just hard to discern the two when you're like a new wine drinker. Mm -hmm. I, think. Mm -hmm. I think that is a totally <clears throat> legitimate learning experience to work through mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it is a dry wine but you see it's not bone dry yeah and, you know it's so uh, anyway bo full bodied yeah there's there's a, a lot of weight and beautiful mm -hmm. full mouth feel on this guy medium to high tannins this guy would go medium so it's not up at that three-quarter level it's definitely more toward the middle acidity this guy would take it down a notch from there it's definitely just medium acid um so it's not it doesn't taste like dried fruit no. So, it, but it's not tart fruit either. Mm -hmm. So right in the middle. And then, like we said, ABV for this guy would be all the way down to the left. Right. So. All right. Moving on. All right. So anatomy of this grape. We're going to deal with a very thick skinned grape. It is a slow ripener. Mm -hmm. So it needs areas where it can get lots of sun, lots of warmth, but not a lot of humidity even though it can handle some humidity because it's got a thicker skin. Okay. Um, thin skin grapes are the ones that rot with humidity, but uh, this guy can handle some, doesn't have to deal with it in Mendoza. <laughs> Mendoza is technically a desert. Okay. Yeah. So the issue with the humidity is rot. I always thought it was mold. Mold turns into rot. Okay. Yeah. It just, they, they go hand in hand. Okay. Yeah. They're like two horsemen of the rotting apocalypse <laughs> from when it comes to wine. So, and what you really don't want is a late, because these need to be on the vine a long time, mm -hmm. you do not want a late season rain to dilute your juice. Right. Right. Because then the, uh, the, Plumps them up. it'll plump them up mm -hmm. with just water and dilute the flavor of your juice. Um, the great thing about Mendoza is they get almost no rain ever. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, like California. Yeah. So, um, so it really works well for that. So this, this guy is kind of. It's very thick on the skin and very medium and moderate throughout the, all the other layers. So okay. not intensely tart, you know, just kind of medium in the rest, but really thick skin with intensity. It gives you the intensity of color and flavors. All right. Next, please. The wine term of the week is negotiant. I can't remember. We might have done this term before. We've definitely talked about it. I don't know if you've put it on a slide before. I wasn't sure either. So mm -hmm. I wanted to cover it again. What is a negotiant? All right. It's a negotiant is somebody who buys grapes, juice, or finished wines, and then bottles it under their own name. Right. But so that sounds like, you, and you have like all kinds of different negotiants. The, um, the Arling Blaze guys that we had their red wines called Hope Dies Last. We, yeah, we, that was one of the wines. That. It mm -hmm. was delicious. Mm -hmm. So there are some people that are negotiants that buy completed wine and then just throw it in a bottle. Oh, right. Right. And I don't know that Arling Blaze is doing that, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't see their winemaker on their website, so I don't know. But, but let's say if they did, right? We still like it. We love the wine. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. There are some that buy, buy it. Like I could buy it. We could do a Tipples wine. Mm -hmm. And I would be a negotiant and it would be a completed wine. They would slap a label on it and that would be that. But there are other ones. Negotiant isn't always so distant from mm -hmm. the process. There are other negotiants where what they're doing is they are working multi-generationally with the wine growers or the grape growers, excuse me. And they even dictate how it's supposed to be grown. 
So they say, all right, look, I guarantee you, I'm going to buy everything you make. Everything you make, I own. But, and so you're never going to have to worry about selling out your full crop. You're going to sell your full crop at this price. But you have to do it. But you way. have to do it this specific way. So it's right. I mean, it's a hair's width away from controlling it with an estate, uh -huh. right? It just means they don't own the land. Oh, yeah, Dr. Fricker, right, Sean Minor wise, he buys the grapes mm -hmm. and he doesn't have as much control as I'm talking about right now, but he's in between. He definitely um, buys the grapes from people that grow it the way he wants it done. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Sean Minor, who does a really nice job with his wines, um, definitely buying, the, he's buying the grapes, vintifying them. So he's making the wine himself mm -hmm. um, and he only buys from people that grow them the way he wants it done so he tells them these are the these are the specs and they tell him the price and then he, he gets that year to year um someone like tonight and very the french styling of it is often i'm going to give you a 10 15 20 year contract and you're going to make it exactly this way including maybe going organic or sustainable and that kind of a thing wow. too as well yeah so it, it can have a whole range of mm -hmm. almost nothing to do with the process, but you slap a label on to you barely don't just own the land. Right. 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 So it's, it's, it's a wide range. So negotiant, there we go. All right. So where are we this week? We are down. Thank you. Down here. Here we go. Southern hemisphere, right about in the middle of the growing latitude. And toward the Andes here. So we've got some nice altitude with the latitude. So uh, let's look at South American wine regions. We were at, uh, was it Uruguay last week? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yes, so it Uruguay. was because I had to find Uruguay on the map. So I had to have <laughs> you lead me to it since I was doing the slides. <laughs> so here's the Chilean wine region and then the Argentinian. We're in Mendoza. That's this big red area here. And then we'll zoom in. All right, within Mendoza, we're within within that. See, we're at the Uco Valley. You see how close it oh, is? It's absolutely. at the foothills of the Andes. Mm -hmm. So the Uco Valley subsection of, of Mendoza at the foothills of the Andes, 2,000 up to 3,000 plus feet above sea level. Wow. So really high altitude. I saw you want to say square feet. I you almost stopped, yeah, I stopped myself. Yes. I so want to say square feet. <laughs> it's not square. <laughs> uh, considered by many it's people linear. to be worthy of its own designation. They were kind of thinking of breaking off. Oh, separate from Mendoza? Yes. Oh, wow. Um, and also because of that, because it's considered to be some of the finest area mm -hmm. in Mendoza. So Mendoza's fighting it big time. Them break yeah, they want to then. keep yeah, it there. They want yeah. to keep them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they say, no, we want to be the Napa Valley of, you know, Argentina and be their own thing. So uh, anyway, I don't know how much back and forth they are going on, but there is discussion that it makes sense. Mm. Um, beautiful place to grow. Um, considered by many to be the best terroir within Mendoza. Terroir, which was a term we talked about before. Combination of the quality of the soil the rainfall and the um, temperatures that it's dealing with, right? So it's the entire, everything that affects it. Just uh, like a very sweet spot for growing wine. It is, mm -hmm. it's a great spot. So, uh, and then also plenty of water available in Mendoza, but you know, let's go with Uco specifically. It gets almost no rain because it's in the rain shadow of the Andes. So how do they have it? They get an incredible amount of snow and so as it melts, if it, it runs <laughs> off down and feeds all the rivers and they're able to just irrigate from there, which allows them complete control over when mm -hmm. and you know how much water is going under the vines and when is it you know, with, with the vines. So sure. when they have a late, when they're moving to the later end of the harvest, they're just not gonna give it any water. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. You know, that's really easy to, to concentrate control. that as much as possible. They concentrate the grapes and yeah, get that, that beautiful, beautiful flavors. So next one. All right. So let's take a look. There are the Andes and you can see it's right there. <laughs> yeah. When they say the right to the foothills, they're not messing around. Absolutely. So Mendoza in general is technically a desert. Like I said, it's in that rain shadow of the Andes. 
It gets almost no rain, gets plenty of snow later on. Uh, it's in its a very flat area, yeah. even though it's high altitude, which mm -hmm. is an unbelievable opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to carve into these yeah, hills. You're not doing terraces. Right. Mm -hmm. It's this flat plateau, or I don't even know counts as a plateau because it's not, it's just such it's, a gradual yeah. thing. But it's this flat area until it just abruptly goes up. But it mm -hmm. is at two to 3,000 feet above sea level. Wow. And so there's another. Yeah, it's just so interesting because it is so flat. Right. And all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny since we're already starting at two, three thousand feet above sea level right here. Right. And then. Yeah, and then yeah. imagine going up into the mm -hmm. into those mountains. That's yep. crazy. So let's see. So we covered all of those guys. So Luca Winery, right? So they're in the. Um, so they're in the Uco Valley, which I'm talking about was within Mendoza. And these are specifically the plots that they work from. And you can see this area here, these, this is the river. So you, they've got all the water they need to be able to move. <coughs> There's a little, you know, obviously a small one over here. They uh -huh. just aren't showing it on the map. So they have plenty of water. Um, so Luca is owned and run by Laura Catena. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. Laura Catena, the Catena family is arguably, because everything is arguable in the wine world, right? The greatest wine production family in Argentina. Laura Catena runs it. She took it over in 97. Laura the whole Catena wines. She took over the Catena family winery okay. in 97. Um, her first vintage was bottled in 1999, mm -hmm. you know, with her at the helm. But Laura Catena is a Harvard and Stanford trained biologist and physician. She still has a medical practice in San Francisco. She bounces between the two. How? I don't know how. I don't know how this is She's possible. extremely organized. Right. She's probably a Virgo. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, and then, so in addition to the Catena family, which we had the Catena tasting mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, amazing wines, right? Yeah. Um, in addition to the Catena tasting, there is the... Um, there are her personal projects. The Katana family. There the, the, there's projects. the Katana family winery, right. which she runs. She also has several other personal projects. She has one from the Valley floor mm -hmm. and one from this guy. Luca is from the Uco Valley. So what happened is in 1998, she had, she traveled to the Uco Valley and, and noticed the amazing potential for it and the old vines that they had in there. So the vines for this area, the Laborde Vineyard, were moved over from France mm -hmm. in 1955. Wow. So they've been there a long time. Yeah. And the wine grower, the grape growers down there were just growing for bulk and selling for cheap wine. And she said, well, wait. From these old vines? From these old vines. And they were just, because it was a matter of, they weren't paring down. They were just growing as much fruit oh, okay. per you know, per sure. acre, per yeah. plant as they could. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't pare down the vines and make it produce the best, right. then you're really not going to get the amazing. But she knew they could be mm -hmm. amazing. So um, she decided to apply the French style of negotiant where she has direct control over the grapes. When she went there, this was not something they were used to doing mm -hmm. and not something they were very open to doing. Ah. So that, you know, all these guys are saying, hey, I grow it. I get X, X number of tons per acre. Right. That's how much I'm making, you know, how I make my money. So she was saying, well, I'm going to pay you more per ton. Right. But you have to do pound. it my way. But you got to do it my way. You got to drop grapes. You got to implement these sustainable mm -hmm. practices and that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. So it was not an instant love affair. But now, 20 years later, it's they're all part of the, you know, Katana family. They love it. And they're year after year, amazing results right. on all of their wines. Yeah. So it really worked out well. She knew, she nailed it. I mean, she knew exactly what she was doing. They make beautiful wines there. But I thought it was really kind of, kind of a really interesting thing that she came there and she saw them. She said, oh, we could do so much better, you know, and let's, let's implement this. And so Good that's what, so they are, um, this is one of, so this one is a negotiant and she has another company that is a negotiant as well at the Valley floor. Okay. So um, also really delicious. So both of her personal things are and, negotiations. Yes. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. And then there's the family estate, which I'm assuming is probably owned by multiple members of the family. Sure. But these are her personally. <clears throat> but I thought it was, let's go to the next slide here. So I was looking for the tasting room mm-hmm. for Luca, which I could not find. Okay. Anyway, so I'm thinking that they serve them at the Katana tasting room. Okay. This is the Katana tasting room. It's interesting because it to me it looks like very Mayan or Aztec. Or, well, I'm know, sure that was like, the yeah, intention, right? Yeah. It, it looks like it a ziggurat, looks, right? right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so that's I decided I was like, well, I want a picture of a tasting room. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure this is where they're. So they doing serve it, it here. They mm-hmm. they might not have their own tasting room. Though. I don't think they do. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I could see. It yeah. wasn't on their website or on any uh, Google Google searches. So I'm pretty sure she she brings them back in, mm-hmm. into this area. It's my best guess. There we go. And if nothing else, Katana has a gorgeous. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, I mean, that's quite a shot. Right? Mm-hmm. All right. So that is the end of this. We're about to go to the the ratings. Okay. So, so would you like for me to stop, let's stop sharing? sharing and talk about the wine one more okay. time now that you guys have been through it? So now we know what, why, when, and where. What do you guys think? Hmm. Julie, you're muted. Yeah, just remember you're muted. So unmute yourself. I was just laughing because Brian did this. I was like, that's not a rating. Like, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, you don't have to give a rating yet. I think it's no, more like we'll, we'll do the rating right in a minute. Let's just oh, okay. any last discussions of of you know the region, the grape, what you're smelling and tasting, whether you're just happy. That's all fine. Happy. Happy. Okay. And Brenda said her started too cold, got much better a little bit later. Mm. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. Yeah, you, you don't get all the nuances of flavor when it's too cold. Nope, mm-hmm. not at all. We yeah, really agree with the, the tea you mentioned. That, that's a new flavor that you haven't mentioned throughout the weeks, I don't think. Well, unless I missed it. But yeah, that, I, I kind of agree with the bitterness, the, like a tea taste. Right. Yeah. You said that. I was Because you said a couple other things. And you said like a dark, what was it, black plum? And I was like, I yeah. get black berry more than black plum. Like we were like analyzing everything you said, like, yes, no, yes, no. And then you said tea. And I was like, yes, like I I really legitimately got that, especially when you first opened it. Um, Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the greatest things is as you taste, you create like this, this um, index in your mind of of flavors, because, you know, when you're grabbing a glass of wine, why am I thinking about black tea? Why, you know, I wouldn't. And also because there is a chocolatiness to this, we've had in the store, a black tea chocolate. Oh, so okay. I've had that combo, sure. you know, and so, and I try to really work all the flavors that I take in every day to create this index that I can pull from. So what but, I heard is eat chocolate. That's oh, eat what, chocolate. That's Look, everyone eat should chocolate. eat chocolate. So we good do, chocolate. We do have some chat too. So after, oh, look. There John's eating chocolate. After being open for about an hour, the wine is even smoother mm-hmm. and easy to drink. Um, either Jerry or Harriet. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, Dr. Fricker first arrived had more like a red blend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I like red blends a lot, which is probably like why I like Syrahs mm-hmm. and Shiraz so much. Um, Chris, I agree. I think it's smoothed and even out, not as big. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Linda, I agree much better as it warmed up a bit. Right. It, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it, as it's going as it opens, it's mm. it's smooth, right? Mm-hmm. It's a velvet, yeah. luscious mm-hmm. wine. And that that lusciousness, meaning it's you know, it's ready to drink now. It won't be a problem within five years. But that's the thing. If you have something and I say, Oh, this would be good for 30 years, it's gonna be wound up pretty damn tight right. at this point. Right. right. So uh this guy is not. <clears throat> you know, this one is very welcoming luscious big yeah yeah. that's what i was going to say like that whole welcoming thing and how it feels like a blend and everything it Mm. makes it easy to take someplace then oh right because it's not a challenging red Mm -hmm. yeah because it is smooth and it's and it's not biting you and i mean i like challenging reds too but but this is just yeah it's an easy win right Mm -hmm. it's there's a lot to it it's it has I mean, it's not just a simple wine, right. but it is an easy win. It's easy to really like this wine, whether you're just starting your wine journey or well into it. It's got something for everybody. Sure. So. 
<laughs> I was just thinking of some, some of the ones. Uh, Molly yeah. Dookers. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So reminds you of like in the Australian, the the large richness of an Australian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is giving up some of the um, secondary qualities a little easier than the Aussies do. You know, when we get to like the tea, the spice, the you know, the pepperiness. You feel like you can taste that more easily with this one than with an Australian? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of Australians, I mean, delicious, mm -hmm. but they can be, they're so big, they're kind of big on the fruit. They tend to be a little more barrel forward from Australia okay. than this guy is. Because once again, we're not talking about vanilla. Right. right. So that would be a young, aggressive barrel aging. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that in us. So they're showing a bit more of what the grape, but obviously that's a very rich grape. Do you know what this is aged in? I don't know. Okay. I, don't know. Hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there's none, but you know, it's you not feel overly like, You aggressive. feel like it's oak, but maybe a French oak? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would, I would guess a French okay. oak. Mm -hmm. All right, um, want to jump back? Okay. We'll finish up. So now you can get ready to rate then. Mm -hmm. So Jeff will explain the ratings. So remember, all right, so here we are. Ratings, a 95 to 100, a classic 90 to 94, outstanding. Oops. 85 to 89, a very good wine. Nothing wrong with that. There's special qualities. 80 to 84, good solid, well-made wine, or 75 to 79, a mediocre wine. So this guy had an outstanding and one that was almost a classic. Right. Yeah. It, it took the whole range of outstanding. Right. It pulled the whole thing from in. 90 so, to 94. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? There's there's a big open area there. Okay. So we've got Chris with a 90 and Robin mm -hmm. with a 91. Mm -hmm. Feel free to throw it in the chat or you can take the mic. So both Laura and John, 92. Dr. Fricker, 90. At least one of the hogs, it's 93. Do you both agree? Oh, she said Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Linda, 91. 92, once it warmed up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So if something, if a red is too cold, what are you going to get out of it? Just not enough flavor? Right. You, you're going to get much more tart, almost cranberry type flavors, okay. that kind of a thing. So it just, it won't, and you especially won't get kind of the rich chocolates or spice. Okay. You might get a little pepper. You could end up with like cranberry and pepper, those high notes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Consuelo, 92. Nice. Julie says 90.5. I love it when she. She does the uh, decimals. Brian says are not 92. A thing. Steve says 88. All right. Decimals are a thing. Maybe not, not for wine, not ratings, wine, but they do exist. <laughs> All right. So, what do you think? I oh, hold on. And then oh, Rachel. Rachel says a 91. Is David there or not? What does it taste like? It's butter or something like that? What? Hmm. I heard something with butter. I know. Oh, he can't math right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I would have said 91, 92. Okay. I mm -hmm. like it. Um, for me, it's an easy drinker. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and it's I mean, I've liked it since when we've opened it. Sure. Um, and it did change just a tiny bit right. because we hadn't had it open for very long. Um, again, as everybody knows, like I like those really big, challenging. Mm -hmm red wines but um but i really like it i think it's just an easy one to just open and drink with you know nothing right. or right. whatever i happen to be eating well, this, because i don't care what it's paired with <laughs> yeah, this, this would be a great one i mean you take to someone's house if, if you're you're having like red meats or mushrooms mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing yeah and you might walk in and a lot of people are not comfortable with syrah they only get you know californian red blend or californian cab right and that's it and you could walk in with this and they're going to love it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you, you could open minds and hearts, you know. Well, and the nice thing with this one is you could open it and serve it. It's going to mm. change a little bit, but it's not changing a whole lot. So, right. okay. So. Um, our, okay. So the ciders was way too cold at the mm. start. So they're still enjoying all the layers. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now that it's open, I mean, if you really chew the wine, which I'll talk mm -hmm. about, really roll it around your palate a couple mm -hmm. of times per sip, mm -hmm. you will get that 
you know, Paul, there there are tannins. They're just not aggressive. So um, they're, they're they're velvet. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Okay, so um, we talked about if it's too cold. What if you forgot to throw it in the fridge and you just opened it? What are you going to taste? Um, this. Oh, fine. okay. I mean, it just warmed up. <laughs> yeah, so no, it's fine. I mean, you don't have to do that. You okay. definitely don't have to do that. I just okay. like to start with that way and move. Forward. Okay. I mean, if you think about European cellar temperatures and- Is not what our houses are like. No, no, it's, it's 55, right. you know, 55 to 60. You my know, house is never 55 well, to 60. And then I wonder also like, you know, whether the, what temperature the restaurant is, but I'm going to guess, I mean, you're, you're there in the summer as a, an American traveler. Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess there's still 70 something degrees. One would hope. Unless I'm asleep, you'd be cold it is not time. 70 in my house. So, right. so <laughs> anyway, so yeah, no, it just comes here. So, that's fine. <laughs> okay. but uh, delicious, del- you know, really nice mm-hmm. wine, velvety, luscious, I think yeah. it's an easy win. I think it's, a, yeah. I could I could throw a 92 at it all day long mm-hmm. easily. So I don't think there's, you know, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's, it's a, I'm really, really happy I drank this wine and the bottle will not make the night. So I think that's. A, yeah, it's already thing. pretty low. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's got like a glass left. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Should we thank our sources? Yes. Kind of a pepper chocolate thing that's so cool all right wine folly always those guys are amazing thank you so much for all the information you share on the internet 750.com that's my source uh, my initial source for everything because i buy through there wikipedia wine for normal people i love that Uh, yeah it's a great name yeah luca wines those are the guys that make Mm -hmm. it uh, decanter had a wonderful picture that was and then the eleanor wine academy had another wonderful picture those are the the ones of the uco valley okay so thank you guys for sharing yep all right and another psa if you use wikipedia throw them five dollars yeah right (laughs) (laughs) next week's wine of the week is white you're welcome brian all right (laughs) So, uh, by the way, this is one of my favorite whites and one of the first ones that really got me saying, oh my, this is cool. All okay. right. Okay. Arnaldo Capri, Grecchetto from Umbria, Italy, right in central Italy. It is uh, uh, James Suckley, 91 points. It is such a cool white wine. It's different from mm-hmm. pretty much anything you will have tasted. Okay. All right. It's very different. It's wonderful. Um, food pairings, look at the pumpkin stuffed pasta, Parmesan crusted scallops, got to have it, um, and almond biscotti. So what I hear is you're making Parmesan crusted scallops. I hope so. It. I would love to. Jeff God. loves scallops. I love scallops. Mm-hmm. So I could do shrimp scampi. I was about to go into a whole description of what it's like, and then I realized that's for next week. Right. But, uh, yeah, don't talk about it. But no, seriously, jump on this wine. It's absolutely delicious. You're going to love it. And it is also got a wonderful, unique qualities. So Gricetto is a very wonderful white wine. Grape. Okay. So yeah, cool. love this stuff. I've been waiting to um, wait. I've been waiting for this wine to get back in stock ah. so I could feature this wine for a long oh, time. Oh, you really like this wine then? Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, not like you're normally lying. I mean, like you really like Yeah, it, I then. really okay. like this wine. Yeah. So. Cool. All right. So looking forward to sharing this. And talking about it with you next week. That almond biscotti just registered. Like, oh, ooh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That would mm-hmm. be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wait till you think about it with the other. Maybe, maybe we'll get some. So, all right. Guys. Sounds good. Um, any last comments or questions about this wine or winery or anything like that before we stop the recording? I would just say from my 90.5 rating, for my, our first bottle, we got two because Steve is visiting. We de- <laughs> decanted <laughs> the, so we we were out late and we threw them in the freezer and the first bottle was a little chilly and we didn't, de- we put it through the aerator, but we didn't decant it. So we went ahead and like decanted uh-huh. the second bottle and let it warm up a little bit. And we liked the second bottle oh, even more. The yeah. Three of us agreed, yeah. Um, yeah. It's got more, so that my original like 90.5, which is kind of lower for me for a red, 
was because it wasn't like as full bodied as I liked typically, but then with the decanting and at the right temperature, I liked it even more. What so. would you go with now? After the decanting? <laughs> so much pressure. Um, <laughs> A 90.5. I mean, a 91.5. I did 90.5. Listen, we're on the second bottle. And the reason we're, is because we were drinking before this. <laughs> <laughs> they pre-gamed and then they had the first right. bottle. So if you average yeah, the both, yeah, you give it a 91. Right. But, but with it being the right temperature and everything, it's 91.5 which rounds to a 92. All right. But I agreed with Dr. Fricker's comment of, of a Syrah, I like this more because it was more like a blend, less, less Syrah-y. Is uh, that a word? No, it, it is it, now. No, yeah. I, I get it though, because this one, of all the Syrahs that we've had, which has just been a few, you mm -hmm. know, over the years, but when we did the dueling Syrahs, mm -hmm. we had a Washingtonian right. Syrah. Mm -hmm which was big and rich like this. Mm -hmm. So to me, this is New World Syrah because okay. whether it was this or the Washingtonian or Shiraz, mm -hmm. they are going to have these similar qualities, right? They're, they're all, they all have that kind of similar thing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you go to France and you get a Rhone Syrah and you're getting a lot more like bacon, pork, spice, and a lighter body, very different but tighter thing. tannins. It's a very different experience. Okay. So that is the venting process? It, it's the terroir. Okay. It's, the, it's yeah, all I, the I choices. I asked this before, yeah, right. and it's yeah. everything. It's, it's all of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And what I've heard with this one is, because we've had at least three people comment, is when it's too cold, they're just not getting out of it what they'd like to get out of it. So. Right. Once it warms up, then they're. That's the. Yeah. That's a great definition for a mm -hmm. cold red. Yeah. It's, okay. It's going to do that. Yeah. I mean, it does it to a white as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Overly cold wine will just not give you a lot of you flavor. Just don't get as many flavors. Right. Mm -hmm. You just be like, oh, this tastes white or this tastes red. And that's it because it's overly cold. So. Or you might say that anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't anymore. Yes. But I used to say that. Right. Yep. All right. Okay. Toast to the week. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Cheers, everyone. We'll see you next week.